Hello, everyone. My name is Rashmi, and on behalf of the DC South Asian Arts Council, I want to welcome you all to the very first DC South Asian Literary Festival. It began on the 9th of May, and it will continue until the 15th of May. To find out more about our upcoming panel discussions and to register for them, please log on to our website, www.dcsaaci.org. As we all know, India is facing a major COVID crisis. And so we wanted to urge everyone who can help to please do so in any way you can. If you choose to donate through our website, we have a donate button. Um, all those funds will be going towards COVID relief. We hope that the situation gets better soon. We hope that this festival brings you some comfort and maybe a distraction from the stress of the, these difficult times. Today is also Eid, and we wanted to wish everyone who's celebrating Eid Mubarak. We wish you loads of love and happiness. Coming to our panel discussion, I am very excited to introduce our moderator for tonight. Her name is Meghna. Meghna is a South Indian diasporic femme, community organizer, and researcher from Georgia. She's also the creator of South Asian Reads on Instagram. It's a bookstagram, so please follow them for excellent book recommendations. She's also an organizer with multiple collectives that are working to end systemic oppression against and within all South Asian communities. Meghna hopes to pursue graduate school in psychology to apply research towards social change and make healing accessible to all peoples. Welcome to our Lit Fest, uh, Meghna, and thank you for accepting our invite. I'm very excited for this. And um, so I'll let you begin. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Rashmi, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Meghna, and on behalf of the DC South Asian Arts Council, I'm so excited to welcome you to the first DC South Asian Lit Fest. Um, and echoing Rashmi, Eid Mubarak to anyone and everyone who's celebrating today. Before we start tonight's discussion, I also want to echo what Rashmi said and just take a moment um, and hold space for folks on the ground in South Asia and folks who might have loved ones there while they deal with the heightened COVID crisis. Sending love to all of you and to folks um, who are on the ground. It's also been a very difficult week in the news. We're sending love and solidarity to our Palestinian kin who are experiencing heightened state violence right now as well. And we are grateful for everyone who is here today and hope that we can spend some wonderful warm time in community with each other. And with that, uh, we're in the company of some brilliant authors tonight, Sanjana Sathyan, Anjali Njeri, and SJ Sindhu. So let's get to it. I'll introduce our panelists first before we get started with the discussion. Welcome, welcome. Um, so first we have Sanjana Sathian, who is a Paul and Maisie Soros Fellow and a 2019 graduate of Iowa Writers Workshop. She has worked as a reporter in Mumbai and San Francisco with nonfiction bylines for The New Yorker, The New York Times, Food and Wine, Boston Globe, and more. And her award-winning short fiction has been published in Boulevard, Joyland, Salt Hill, and The Master's Review. Gold Diggers, which I have right here, is her first book. S.J. Sindhu is a Tamil diaspora author of two novels, The Award-Winning Marriage of a Thousand Lies, also right here, and Blue Skin Gods, which is coming out in November. She's also the author of two hybrid chapbooks, I Once Met You But You Were Dead, and Dominant Genes, forthcoming in 2022. Sindhu teaches at the University of Toronto, Scarborough. And last but not least, we have Anjali Njeti. Anjali is a former attorney and award-winning journalist based near Atlanta. She's the author of Southbound, essays on identity, inheritance, and social change, and The Parted Earth, a novel that's also coming out this year. Her work has appeared in Harper's Bazaar, Boston Globe, and elsewhere. And she's the co-founder of Desi Blue Georgia, an organization for South Asian Democrats. And she teaches in the MFA program at Reinhardt University. 
I'm so excited to be here with all of you today and so grateful for all of your work. Um, to start with, maybe could each of you share just a bit about your debut book and what does it feel like to be a published author? Thank you so much. Uh, I, I really appreciate being here. I love that this is the inaugural year for this event. What, a, what an amazing honor. I'm going to apologize for my voice. I've uh, had a pretty bad cold the last few days. I'm hoping it lasts through the session. Um, so I'm so excited to be here. Um, being with South Asian writers feels like being home to me. Um, I'm so grateful for the really strong writing community that we have here. Um, I, uh, I had a long publishing journey and ended up publishing two books within 18 days of one another. The first one is Southbound, which is a collection of essays um, that basically talks about how identity uh, can shape social change. Um, and my novel is called The Parted Earth. It takes place over a 70 year period, beginning with the 1947 partition and proceeding to 2017, and it involves characters who lived during the partition, um, and then other characters who've lived in the decades since, and sort of how they piece together the mysteries uh, behind uh, their, their trauma and try to uh, reunite with one another. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Cindy, and uh, my book is, my debut book um, is called Marriage of a Thousand Lies, and it, um, is about, I was gonna say was because it feels so long ago. It was 2017, um, but it uh, it is about a um, young Tamil lesbian um, named Lucky, and it traces her coming out process um, as she tries to do it in her late 20s after she's married, um, and it deals with issues of family and cultural identity and sexuality and how all of those things sort of merge together for a lot of us. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm so excited to be here echoing kind of what Anjali said about uh, the sense of community that I think we haven't always had um, among South Asian writers. Um, my first book, Gold Diggers, came out earlier this year. Um, it's about an Indian American sort of slacker, underachiever, according to his own community, named um, Neil Narayan and his a neighbor um, who he is kind of in love with named Anita and the two of them get involved in a series of gold thefts and um, they then have some like some a magical uh, a ritual that they perform on the gold which allows them to steal the ambition of other people in their community and it's sort of a semi-comic semi-serious um, investigation into what it means to be addicted to ambition to achievement culture and what that does to the soul. Thank y'all for sharing. And I've had a chance to read the books a little bit. So it's really exciting to kind of see you in person and get to meet the author behind the book. Um, Anjali, you mentioned a little bit kind of the publishing journey was really long for you and it was exhausting. And I'm curious what it was like for all of you being South Asians, you know, writing about South Asians, navigating the publishing industry. Um, and maybe we can start with Sindhu and then Sanjana. Um, I have a lot of feelings about this. I, I think that um, from the time my first book came out to the time like my second book is coming out now, even in just that amount of time, the publishing industry and its stance on South Asian books has changed. Um, it So when my first book came out, it was very much like, you know, every publisher had like one South Asian book per season and like, you know, you don't, you, you can't have two. Uh, and, and it was, um, you know, it created a culture where South Asian books were essentially fighting against each other for placement on, on uh, publishers lists. Um, and then, you know, of course, like certain agents would have South Asian authors on their list, but they can't have too many, you know, there, there's just, there was all these um, kind of thoughts about quotas, even though, even if people didn't call them that. And so like, that's the kind of environment into which my first book um, went out to publishers. And then now I think, I think it has gotten better. Of course, it's not great. Um, but I think that there's this greater acknowledgement within the publishing industry that 
uh, South Asia is a very varied and diverse place and that there are many different voices and many different kinds of experiences that need to be um, published or need to be written about and then published. So I, I think, um, I think my second book, you know, process is very, very different. Um, but I also will say that I, like, there is this thing in the publishing industry where they really love it when you're one kind of marginal identity, but when you're multiply marginalized, um, in intersecting ways, like South Asian queer, for example, they don't know what to do with you. They don't know how to market you. They don't know what box to put you in. Um, they don't know what label to slap onto your book in the back. Um, and so it gets really complicated and a lot of people, a lot of editors shy away from books um, that, that talk about multiple kinds of marginality. Yeah, um, I sold my book in um, October of 2019 um, and it, it just came out and I unfortunately kind of heard and saw similar things as, as Sindhu did. Um, uh, there were editors who uh, I was told not to go to because they had already bought their India book. Um, even like no one was even using the term South Asia. It was the India book for, uh, for the season. Um, and I think last year was interesting because there were there was this rush um, when all of a sudden like America realized that it had been racist, um, but it like didn't know how to behave to like multiple racial identities. And so, you know, there were these moments of like um, editors reaching out to agents and saying like, can you give us some of your writers of color? Can you have them like trot out a piece um, suddenly? And it was like, like, a major prominent magazine was like, we're gonna do a summer of marginalized stories. And I was like, what were you doing before? So um, yeah, I think there is still um, a lot that's really wrong. And I've, I, it's, been, it's been really hard to see a lot of incredibly talented friends still struggle with this. Um, uh, I got super lucky with having the right agent who is just like really fierce and, and like is an advocate um, for my work. Um, even though she is not South Asian, she just, she got it. And I've been really lucky to have on my publishing team um, uh, kind of a mix of a mix of people. So multiple ages um, and like my publicist is Asian American um, on the marketing team. Um, I work with a woman who's South Asian American. And so my, my editors are white, but they have been really good about giving me the space to like build the world that I want to build and have not made me sort of like answer questions that are not natural to the book itself. And in fact, one thing that I really loved about my editor is a couple times in the margins she would write, um, is this actually a thought that the character would have for themselves or are you doing this to explain it to us? Um, and so I think she, like some of those values like are there. My editor has been awesome about that. I have loved having an Asian American publicist in particular because I think she, like the the scary hard stuff often happens when you like go from making art to making, to being told that you've made a product and it has to be pushed and shelled. And having an Asian American publicist be the person I work with in that process was, um, it meant that like she learned how to, she, she spoke about it in a way that didn't flatten the book. And I think that's really hard to do. Um, and I, I like, that's an enormous privilege that I just, I hope we keep having more people enter this industry and make it possible for people to enter this industry who can have that textured experience, because I know that that, that, that is a serious privilege. Yeah. So, um, I tried to get one of seven books published over 11 years, um, 11 years of submitting to agents and editors. Um, and in a cup for a couple of those books, I did end up with agents, but uh, it did not work out with them. So I sold Southbound in the Parted Earth uh, by myself to small presses. I was just not going to, I was clearly not going to begin an agent. And then uh, uh, what was left, what was available to me were small presses. So um, uh, I think Southbound sold first on proposal to University of Georgia Press. And um, 
The Part of Earth sold about nine months later to Hub City Press. They're both amazing presses um, and I'm so lucky to have them, but it's really hard to not have an agent. I'm, you know, I'm working on my next book now and I don't have an agent. Um, and of course my advances were really, really small um, and not, I'm very lucky in that I can afford to sell books for so little money. Uh, it, but it does involve a significant amount of privilege to be able to do so because I spent so much time on these books. And um, because these are small presses, they can't give you uh, the kind of advances that you would get from larger presses. Um, having said that, they're doing a dynamite job um, with the books. Um, I hired some independent uh, publicists to help out, which has been super fantastic for me. Um, I have uh, several chronic illnesses and I, I couldn't have done a lot of the publicity myself. Um, so, um, so yeah, I still consider myself very lucky. I have friends who have submitted for longer than I have. So from the time I started trying to sell one of my books until the first book came out was 13 years. I have friends who are nearing 20 years and these are extremely talented right, South Asian writers. Um, their books should have been in the world years ago. But I agree with SJ. She said something really important um, that it's even changed in the last few years. My first novel took place in North Georgia and um, I had a lot of interest in it, but it was an Indian family living in North Georgia. And this was a book I was trying to sell eight to 10 years ago, I think. Maybe, maybe about, about 10 years ago, I started trying to sell it. And the kinds of rejections I got were basically saying what were Indians doing in, in North Georgia or what were Indians doing in Georgia at all, really. Um, and we had lots of South Asian um, authors writing in Georgia. It's just that um, a lot of them were writing uh, children's books and YA. And I think those editors are a little bit more open minded <laughs> than uh, adult literary editors who who. I feel are just not as evolved uh, when it comes to issues of race and ethnicity um, and what what they picture as a, as, as a, who the character should be in a story, especially when we're talking about the geographic region in the South. So I've uh, I pulled out that first novel recently and I was like, I'm going to rewrite it. Um, but I'm going to try this again because I this family lives in North Georgia and I North Georgia is a place I've been to a million times. It's really dear to me. There are Indians living up there and uh, and I feel a little bit more encouraged that maybe uh, someone will take this book on and maybe maybe the minds of editors have expanded in what they can can see in certain locations. Absolutely. Thank you all for sharing. Um, yeah, it's really wild to think about how awful and frankly oppressive that industry sounds, but it's so wonderful that there's voices like yours um, that are that are visible and present um, for other younger writers to look to. Um, and on that note, I'm curious, I'm sure we might have people in the audience who are aspiring writers. Um, what is some advice or, or something that you've learned from in your own journey that you'd want to share? with younger writers that might be in the audience. Um, and maybe we can start with Sanjana and then Cindy. Yeah, um, when I teach uh, undergrads in particular, um, I try to be really honest with them about how difficult it is to do this with your life. Um, there are, are, it's like psychically difficult, it's materially difficult um, if you are like worried about making ends meet it can like it's 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 extra difficult when you're trying to make art um, and this thing doesn't have value in the world. So when I talk to students about it, I try to talk to them first about like developing a really personal and private relationship with art before trying to think about how they can make it function in the market, um, because it will be so difficult to do this that at various points, like you will have to do it while having a job that sucks the life out of you and dealing with family and dealing with health issues. Um, and so you only keep going, I think, if there's this like deep wellspring in you that still just loves to read as much as you love to read when you were a kid. 
um, against all odds. Um, and so a lot of what I talk to people about is just like developing your own practice of writing. Um, for me, that's involved um, reading every day. I can't when I'm not reading, when I'm not excited about a book or two, I, I cannot write. Um, it involves writing by hand um, semi-regularly um, and then switching over um, to the computer, which is a way of getting me to be in communication with like, it's incomplete, it's gonna look ugly kind of energy. Um, and, and once I was ready to like potentially try to, like I, I had written all these stories and I didn't know what to do with them. Um, I was in my mid twenties, I was working as a journalist and it was the first time that anyone told me that some MFA programs were funded. I didn't know that. Um, I always was like, why would you get a degree in creative writing? That's a crazy thing to do. Um, uh, with like the voice of my mother in my head. And it is a crazy thing to do. Like you are, you are, put, you're taking yourself out of society in a lot of ways. Um, but if you are thinking of going that way, um, I always recommend to people not doing it right out of school and having like a significant like period of life outside of um, being in a school environment. Um, I think it can be really tempting if you've like been on the school treadmill to like just keep going and it was really good for me to have like been in the world a little bit um and uh then i encourage people to try to go to one where they're going to be funded so that they are uh not stressed about like paying back debt um because i think that that is that is really extra difficult and then also to if you are in the position to go to an mfa program um but you might be able to negotiate how much money you get, which is also something I didn't know about. Um, but I found out later that like some uh, some kids who like for whom negotiation came quite naturally had like talked their way up. And so I think like all of these like material uh, issues are so real that like I always try to address those before talking about like all of the mystical parts because you want to have access to the mystical parts. But you have to have this like practical brain on and then the mystical brain and like the practical brain is often a prerequisite. Um, but there's this Baldwin quote I love that's like, find a way to live and to write and that is all. And that's maybe what it comes down to for me. Okay, I guess I'll go next. Um, uh, I have two things. So um, I also teach creative writing to undergrads and it's this is something that comes up a lot um, where people ask me, you know, what do I have to, when, once they understand just how hard it is to actually publish something. Um, a lot of my students start asking questions about like, so what do I need to write to get published? Like what, what's popular? What, what do they want? Um, and, I, and I always tell them, you know, don't write toward trends. Uh, there are trends in any, any sort of genre. And I think it's, it's more evident in commercial genres. So like, you know, zombies are popular sometimes, or like then there's mermaids, and then you know, like they go in and out of fashion. But I think either, even in the literary world, there's things that are popular, right? Um, at certain times, there's like dystopian literature, uh, literary dystopian fiction comes in and out of um, you know, in and out of fashion depending on who's in office. And um, there's like you know, environmental stuff or or uh, like feminism, feminist stories, queer stories, whatever. Um, just write the thing you want to write because honestly there's such a huge lag between when you start writing something and when it's out on the shelves that the trends will have changed five times by then so there's really no way to know like the people that sold covid stories this year like the novels they didn't write it this year. Most of them started writing pandemic novels like six years ago, and it just happened to fall on 2020, and then they got, got to sell their novels. Um, so like, sometimes people just get lucky with timing, uh, but you can't like try to plan for it. I don't think that that works. Um, and the other thing I, I tell my students is that tenacity pays off. Um, in, in, in this game, you know, it's about patience and it's about sticking to it because, you know, most people, I think at least most Americans think that they have a novel in them, but most of them won't start writing. And the, of the people that start writing, most of them won't finish a first draft. And those that finish the first draft, most of them won't revise and then on and on and on. And at every step, 
if you can pass that step and if you can keep going, you are getting, you know, you're sort of narrowing down smaller and smaller into a pool where you're eventually going to get published, hopefully. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen along the way and it's really, really hard still, but that's really the best shot you have is to just keep going because as you keep going, again, you're just narrowing the pool and uh, the smaller it gets, the better your chances. I would agree with all of that. Um, and I would add that um, I think it's really important for people to find a <clears throat> nurturing community of writers. Uh, your writing community will be there for you all the time when you need them. They'll, they will pick you up off the ground when you are feeling very dejected about publishing, about whatever you're working on. They will be your cheerleaders for you. So go out and find other writers that will nurture you and love you, but also that they'll hold you accountable, right? They'll say like, well, how's that novel going that you were talking about? You haven't said anything for a while. And it really gets you thinking about that novel again, if it has been like six months since you've touched it. So find a community of writers. I've been very, very, very lucky in this regard. Um, I Some of the people in my community have have been in my writing community for over a decade. Many of them actually are South Asian women and femmes um, and, uh, and black women and Latinx women. And I'm so grateful for them. And I will tell you if there is a single reason why I was able to get published, it was because of my writing community because trying for 11 years is a really long time. And in 11 years, you get not just hundreds of rejections, but you get thousands of rejections for multiple books. I would have quit. I was ready to quit. And I was actually at peace uh, at quitting. I was like, you know what? This just isn't going to be for me. My community of writers rallied around me and they said, look, take a break, but then keep going. Thank you for sharing all of that wisdom with us. Um, we talked a little bit about kind of like the barriers and, and things that are hard. And I'm curious, what brings you joy in, in writing, whether it's the craft or, you know, sharing a certain piece of your life? Um, what brings you joy? And maybe you can start with Anjali and whoever would like to go after that. Gosh, that's a hard question. Um, so I think I feel the most amount of joy while writing when I finally get to that point where I really know a character as well as I know myself. And that takes me a long time. That takes me years. Um, it takes me many, many drafts of re revision. Um, and I'm writing sort of around the character and around and around like a spiral, but I'm not quite getting the character how they need to be on the page. And it doesn't quite feel like somebody real and somebody tangible, somebody that you know I'm dreaming about. So that moment when I realize I finally know one of my characters, um, not only does that feel so good to me as a writer, but oftentimes the writing then goes faster because I know exactly what that character would do in a certain situation. Um, and so to me that, that just brings me such joy because I basically feel like I've taken a character that was maybe very two dimensional for a really, really long time and added this third dimension. And it became somebody that I, that I feel like I knew intimately. Um, but that's a process that takes me a while. Then when it finally happens, I feel like I've struck gold. No pun intended, Sanjana. <laughs> yeah, I can cheat off that. Um, oh, sorry, Sindhu. Um, uh, similarly, I, I wrote my undergrad thesis on um, Zadie Smith's work, and I feel like most of my ideas about writing come from her. And she talks about this moment when you're in the midst of, of work and every thought that occurs to you, everything that happens, everything you read just filters into the book or into the project that you're working on just then. Like a stray comment can be lifted wholesale or can somehow infuse your understanding of a character. And um, it it's when it's a moment where like, I feel like writing so much of is about swinging between like total megalomania and total depression. And uh, maybe that's just me, but uh, these, those are the moments of like the 
like I I'm doing it. I'm making a world. Um, uh, there's, there's still the chance you're flying too close to the sun and the next day it will be total crap. But, um, those are, those are nice moments when you feel like your brain is letting you into some new understanding. I, I totally agree with both of those answers. And I, I just want to highlight that, that, you know, the writing process itself has to be joyful. And if it's not like, you know, there's, I see all these memes online about how, you know, you're a writer if you hate writing. And I was like, if you hate writing, don't write. Like, why are you torturing yourself at that point? You know, <laughs> um, I, I feel like, you know, at, at least mo like the majority of the writing process needs to bring you some sort of joy as you're in it because you're right, especially if you're writing books, it's a very long process. It's not just writing the book, right? It's it's so many revisions. And, you know, I, I go through like a lot. I go through 10 to 20 drafts of something. Um, and and I cannot imagine doing that if I didn't really love it. Uh, but that's that's one thing I really love is the revision process when like there's always that draft where like, you know, all this mess that you've created sort of clicks and it becomes sort of a cohesive story. And it and then you like spend a lot of time buffing the scenes out. And I love like, you know, reading a final um, I'm, I'm reading the final draft of my second novel right now. And I was like wow, you can't even see where I've like wedged in all of this like disparate little pieces into this story. Like you can't see the scenes anymore. And that, that's a really cool moment to, to see that you've produced something uh, sort of seamless. Um, and, you know, as, as flawed as it might be, it's seamless and that's really cool. Um, and I will also say like outside of the writing process, I, it brings me so much joy to see like my friends getting published, um, especially like, especially when they've been trying for so long or, or you know, what have you. But um, I also get asked about like jealousy. And I was like, well, you kind of have to train yourself out of jealousy. Um, you can't, if you're constantly jealous of your friends, that's, that's no way to live, right? Um, you, and, and it, I just love um, seeing, friends and even acquaintances find, um, find success because I think, especially when, if it's marginalized, you know, marginalized identities of any sort, uh, the more, you know, the more success that someone else has, the more space they create for more stories that are more diverse. So I, I, I think um, any sort of BIPOC writer or queer writer or whatever, um, finding success is always a good thing, is always a good so beautiful um and thinking a little bit about you know some of the note you brought up around marginalized writers finding success um south asia is such a diverse place and the south asian diaspora has extremely varied experiences what are ways that you all want to see the south asian creative space shift to better reflect that diversity and this is a two-part question who are some authors maybe in addition to yourselves that we should also be reading um, and maybe we can start with some new. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm really curious to hear what everyone else thinks about this, because I think it's sort of an, an open question that we're all trying to figure out right now. I think most of us know that very a very specific subset of South Asian America has been elevated and like a very specific aesthetic. Um, uh, you know, Chamunda and Gozi Adichie talks about this idea of a, the danger of a single story. And I think in, in addition to the dangers of a single story, we've seen a single aesthetic um, that has been sort of recycled and recycled and recycled. Um, and that aesthetic reflects, um, it reflects generally like dominant caste, Hindu, upper middle class. Um, I am all of those things. And so I'm pretty aware of the ways in which my work was easier for people to down than others. I think aesthetically I diverge from a lot of uh, other diaspora writing that that I grew up reading, but um, yeah, like I think it, like that's probably step one is figure out like why it might've been easier for someone to relate to my book than it is for someone to relate to another book because what is relatability? So I think that's important. Um, and then I think, I, I don't know, I feel personally kind of a lot of pressure to 
um, take whatever space I'm given and talk about that sort of texturing of the diaspora, it gets really exhausting. Like it's really hard to do that every time you're talking to an interviewer um, who may not be familiar with the South Asian diaspora, or if they are, they're like upset about the same things that we're upset with. So I think we have to keep doing this dance sometimes to like keep reminding people that one story cannot stand for everything. Um, so a lot of what I do is nod to other stories. Um, I think it's, um, I always tell people, I think a lot of diaspora kids maybe didn't grow up reading um, much about cast. And I talk about um, reading the Annihilation of Caste the first time I went to India. And that's something that I think a lot of people um, in the di in the diaspora in particular, like have this moment of, of reading it and it, it, it blows minds. Um, and that that's a book that I often talk about. We shall be reading Yashika Dutt coming out as Dalit. Um, I always recommend the um, Vivek Bald book, um, South, uh, uh, Bengali Harlem and the Last Histories of South Asian America, which is a history that really changed my relationship to the understanding of like what the South Asian diaspora has been, that it has been more textured um, in terms of class and documentation. Um, and then I also just want to shout to um, a novel coming out next year called All This Could Be Different by Sarah Thuncombe Matthews, who is a friend of mine and one of these people who I've been so excited, um, uh, as Sindhu was saying, to see succeed. Um, uh, she's super talented and it's a, a novel that is like a queer collective anti-capitalist coming of age story. And like you put all that stuff on a book and you're like, wow, this is going to be like serious. And it manages to be both a novel of ideas and also like sexy and funny and just all of the things that you want in a book while also making it easier for us to engage with difficult ideas. Um, yeah. I think, um, you know, speaking of just like acknowledging our own privileges, I, th I think like, you know, for diaspora writers who are South Asian who grow up in the West, um, we're used to thinking of ourselves as minorities and as oppressed people. And so it's really difficult sometimes to switch that and to think about the ways in which within the South Asian population, we might be privileged, like, um, you know, in terms of caste or religion or skin color, um, you know, what kind of features you have, um, you know, hair texture, all of that. And I think it's also like, m my discomfort with the South Asian literary scene has always been that it's like South Asian has always equaled Indian. And without the acknowledgement that like there's a lot of other cultures and places and languages um, within South Asia. Like I was on a South Asian lit panel at, um, at a literary festival a couple of years ago when where the panelists, a couple of panelists were like cracking jokes in Hindi. And like while they were on the panel and like, you know, there's me, a, a, a you know, some Tamil person who doesn't speak the Hindi, and then there was a Pakistani um, panelist. There was some um, someone else who's a non-Hindi speaker, um, and I'm sure in the in the room as well. And I was just like, you know, this is we're not a monolith, and to um, to think of ourselves as one is really hurtful, I think. Um, but as far as uh, writers that I would recommend. I have several. Um, Mimi Mondal, who was a sensitivity reader for me for um, my upcoming book, is a very accomplished writer herself and um, is really awesome and does um, sort of like really cool like spec fic um, type stuff. It's, it's, it's great. You should definitely check her out. Um, two poets, Rita Mukherjee and Avni B.S who are doing a lot of like, a lot of poetry about like self image and um, what it is to live in a brown body as a femme, all of that, um, all of those really, really complicated issues. Um, you, you know, ideas of your such beauty, blah, blah, blah. Um, really, really awesome, awesome people. Uh, Vivi Ganeshanandan and Marianne Mohanraj um, who are also doing some really interesting things uh, with genre and um, Vivi Ganesh and then runs uh, the uh, Lit Hub podcast as well. So um, is like super involved in the writing community. 
And, you know, I, I, I just think, I mean, I, I can keep listing people that I'm really passionate about reading. Uh, but, you know, the, it's, it's really cool that we've seen such an explosion of talent out of the South Asian community. And I, I just hope that um, we sort of continue to recognize our own privileges and make space for the people who aren't yet being given a chance. Um, I would agree. And actually, you all mentioned many of the writers that uh, I was planning on mentioning. I would uh, add to this uh, Rajiv Mohaber, who's queer Indo-Caribbean memoir is coming out this year and Gayatri Sethi, who's, uh, she primarily, uh, she's Indian, but she primarily grew, grew up in the African sub uh, African continent. So in two different countries. So um, I think that's another part of the diaspora that um, is not really known. Uh, the diaspora that, um, you know, were, were taken uh, initially as indentured servants, moved to another uh, c country that was colonized besides uh, the subcontinent um, and, and spent most of their life there. I would say in general too, um, that I, I really hope we have more uh, books in translation from South Asia. We just don't have enough of it. I know um, Jenny Bott uh, uh, published one late last year, but I, I think that would be fantastic. They're very hard to find. And when they are published, they don't get a whole lot of publicity behind them. I think we just still have a very sort of Eurocentric view about um, translated books. Uh, you know, you can't get enough French books in translation, um, but you know, we have multiple, I mean, there's a huge, huge literary industry in the subcontinent. So it would be great if we had translations, um, of course, not just from India, but uh, from Sri Lanka, from Bangladesh, um, Nepal, I, any any South Asian country to, to get them here and to get support for them here and to get big presses publishing the translations here. You know, we have so many small presses doing this work, but they don't have the big marketing machine behind them. So um, I'm really hoping we have more of that in upcoming years. Thank you all for sharing. Um, I think maybe we have time for one more question before we do audience Q&A. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, kind of, I guess, looking towards the future and thinking about artists and the role of art um, and how artists have the ability to create and imagine without restrictions, um, especially thinking about the events in the last year, you know, everything that's going on in the world right now. What role do you see artists playing in creating a more just and a more free world? Um, maybe we can start with Sindhu and then Anjali. I think that, I mean, I'm a writer, so I really, I, I firmly believe that art can change the world. Um, but I think it's also, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that, but I'm also gonna pull back and say, you know, it depends on really like, it's not just the creation of the art, right? It's the creation of the space that holds the art, it's the creation of the community that's around the art and and the, the changing of the audiences that are receiving the art. So I think like audiences are getting more and more um, sophisticated in being able to consume and interact and engage with more and more diverse stories. But um, I think there's a long ways to go still. Um, I think, especially in the writing world, there's a certain type of South Asian story, and we've talked about this, that, that's expected by audiences. And that is rewarded when, you know, when we write those stories, we are rewarded by the publishing industry and, and encouraged to keep producing those instead of um, diversifying or trying something new or um, maybe not even writing, but making trying to make space for other people who are trying to come into the world. Um, but yeah, I really do think that art needs to address the big questions of climate change and inequality and war. Um, and I, and I, I don't know, I don't know if we can make big changes, but I think we can make incre incremental changes that maybe can add up, but I'm an optimist. Well, <clears throat> I'm an organizer, so I will talk a little bit about this from an organizing perspective. Some of the best organizers I know are artists because organizing requires you to shape a narrative 
and to help people feel empowered by their voices so that they can pre pressure systems to change. Um, it really is about getting people's narratives out there and then pushing for specific changes. Um, some of the best organizers I know are artists. They are painters, they are sculptors, they are writers. And um, I would love to see more artists and more writers become organizers. Um, many of them are, you know, uh, doing comms during the day and doing their writing at night. Um, one of the ways that we have relied on so much the past year for, for, to do organizing work, because we, we had COVID, right? We could not do as much in-person work as we wanted to do, you know, going out into communities, which is what a lot of times we do do. We have amazing graphic artists, like getting across messages, dispelling disinformation with these fantastic graphics that we then like drop in WhatsApp groups and then they go viral and TikTok videos by these genius comedians. So <clears throat> I would really love to see more artists get involved directly in organizing work because that creativity, I mean, the creativity gets people to the polls. It gets people to protests. I mean, it, it gets people to uh, calling out large institutions. And um, and I would, so I would love to see more people get, more artists in general, get direct, like find some group, find some organization that pushes for change, not necessarily in the art world, but just, just in some other capacity and use your creativity to, to uh, push for change because uh, I, I'm blown away, blown away by what <clears throat> organizers who are artists have, have come up with, especially under the constraints we've lived under in the past year. Yeah, I, um, I have a lot of respect for, um, for organizers and ultimately I know I don't do that well. So I tend to take that direction from people who are better at it. I do know some people who manage to wear, wear both hats, but um, for me, like I, I really am sort of primarily and, and solely an artist. Um, but I think about, I think about political issues as we all must. Um, I think though that sometimes these serve different functions. And I think one of the most radical possibilities of art is that it is not productive. Like I think sometimes we can turn art into, we can set expectations on it that are actually, they mimic the way we think about productivity in a capitalist economy. We're like, what will this do for us? Um, what does reading a book do when the world is on fire? I think it's possible to say it does nothing um, or that the thing it does is very, very minor because ultimately like books can change our collective imagination. We all know that. However, the people who pick up, pick up books may not need their collective imagination changed that much. Um, often we really are dealing with incremental changes among people who are already kind of on our team. So when we, when we take that as potentially a given, it's like, I think, I think it's really radical to consider the impotence of art. Um, and like thinking about this a lot, like under, under the Trump era, like I think we wanted our art to, to save the world and change the world and be a balm for the world. And ultimately I think that meant sometimes we let tyranny into what is a deeply private and intimate space that can exist apart from tyranny. There are as many ways for art and politics to intersect as there are individual humans. Um, uh, and so I, th I think there are a bunch of different angles, but, but these days I often find it necessary to say, there is work that happens when I exist in public and there's work that happens that exists in private and I'm not always wise to the way those two intersect. I will also say that, that it's, it's important to recognize over and over the power of representation and just on an individual level you know even if we're not making huge systemic change i think for somebody who is you know marginalized in multiple ways and is oppressed by many different kinds of systems it can be life-changing to see a mirror of your story 
that you never thought you would see, right? And, and um, you know, I, I study queer literature and that's something that I, I try to hold with me at all times that, you know, the most vulnerable people are often the ones who can be most radically changed or benefited by, you know, just the right piece of art at the right time. So, and, and, and it's, it's also like the more commodified the art is, the harder it is to make change. So somebody in the comment section, you know, said something about movies and like, yeah, it's hard for movies to affect change because there are, they, like the budgets are huge. Every, like there's so many people that are invested in it. And so it's hard to have a, a more radical, you know, movie than it is to have a book because the investment that goes into it by these big conglomerates um, is, you know, is, is very different on a different scale. And so like, there's, there are different kinds of art that can do different things as well. Thank you all for sharing. Um, that's such a wonderful note to, to wrap and move into our audience um, uh, questions, thinking about the power of art. The first question that I see here is, at what point of your writing journey did you realize that a piece of art was ready to get published? Um, Karen Tidback, this wonderful speculative fiction queer writer told, told, a, um, my class at the Clarion Writers Workshop that it's just when you can't look at the thing anymore. Um, I don't know if that's always helpful, but I do think sometimes it's like wits end, um, put it away for a few months, um, maybe don't immediately send it into the world, but if if you've taken it as far as you can go, like if you really think that you have scooped out your insides and there is nothing left, um, I think that's a decent sign. I mean, you know, I, when I was uh, doing a book event the other night, I was trying to look through for an excerpt to read. And even then I was like, oh, you know what I should have done in this scene? I mean, in some ways, the story, even after it's been published, is is not going to be finished, right? I mean, you're always going to find ways in your own work that you might have changed it. You might have done something different. I mean, I was just regretting the other day not having a character do something in my novel. So at one point, you just have to feel like whatever the message is of your book, whatever the purpose was of your story, if you can effectuate that, if you feel like that gets to the reader, it's done because you're always going to feel like you could improve it in some way or that you could have, you know, added something or deleted something. I mean, I still do now. I still do question, oh, I took an essay out of this book. Maybe I should have left it back in. I mean, it's always going to kind of haunt you in that way. But I think if you feel like you made your argument, you made your you made your case for the reader and you gave them something to walk away with that was beautiful. I, I, I mean, I think that's the point when you stop. Um, another question we have is, and I think this is wonderful because I know two of you have, I think, professional or MFAs and Anjali, I'm, I'm not sure if you were an attorney before, right? Um, the question is, is it important to get a degree in creative writing to become a great writer? Or if we're experienced and have a creative mind, is that enough? Um, okay, so I, <laughs> I saw this question earlier come up in the comments and I was like, I have, I have an answer. Um, so <laughs> uh, my answer is that, you know, no, it's absolutely not necessary to have an MFA or any kind of creative writing degree. But what the degree does is basically give you a very condensed amount of time in which you are A, focusing on your art, and B, learning a lot of things from other people without having to do it through trial and error. So you have these people guiding you through your, your learning curve, essentially, in, you know, if, if our taste is here and our skill is here, it you know, it takes a long time to uh, get your skill up to the level of what you expect good writing to sound like. And doing the doing a program helps you do it faster. I think that's the only thing that it actually does is help you do it faster. It also connects you to other people faster, right? You form creative community faster because you have access 
all of a sudden to a group of writers. Um, so I, I really think it's about time. Uh, it's about condensing the time that it takes to get from point A to point B. Yeah, I'll just add, so I did what's called a low residency MFA program. And so in a low residency program, you basically still keep working your day job and then you have these residency periods. Some programs have, I teach in one now as well. We have one 10 day period where students come full time on campus and then everything else is done online. I mean, this was long before COVID. These programs existed. I graduated from Queens University in Charlotte. I thought it was wonderful. I, I, I'm so glad I did it. They are cheaper, or at least when I graduated uh, in 20, early 2015, they were cheaper than paying full tuition at a full-time program. So you, you paid, I mean, I think I paid less than half, um, but I also was working. So, I mean, you, you're not, um, you, you're still, most people have their jobs. A lot of people in the programs have children and can't move them. Uh, for two or three years to do an MFA program, as, as I did. Um, people have partners. They can't have their partners uh, move with them and don't want to be apart from them. So I thought it was, what I liked about my program was not only did I work with some great people and form a really tight-knit community with a lot of other students, it mimicked what writing is like in the real world, right? You go to your job, you take care of your children, or if you have them, or, or elder care, if that's your thing. And then you you have to write at night when the house is finally quiet. So I felt like it really got me into, in addition to having me meet so many great writers, it really got me into this great routine. And what I also loved about low res programs is that the age range is huge. You have a lot of people who are retired. It's so great to be in a classroom of writers when there are people in their like 70s and 60s and 50s and you've got people from all walks of life and um, I, I thought it was fantastic. And, and, I, I, and I agree with SJ. I, I really don't think you have to get a degree at all. But if you can't upend your life and you're okay with paying some for a program and taking out some loans, but not taking out all the loans, um, you know, look into a low residency program. There are a few that, that have scholarships, but not many. Um, but, um, but it's a great program and people oftentimes take semesters off so they can take their time to pay for the program. And there was a lot of flexibility in it that I really, really appreciated. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, I think we have one more question and then we're going to wrap. Um, have you used non-English words while writing about a South Asian concept? And if you have, how do you explain it? Or do you trust that the reader will understand? Um, so I'll just say this real fast <laughs> because I, I'm in the middle of proofreading right now. So I, I have a lot of non-English words in my work. Um, if, if, if there's no direct translation or if the character is bilingual and would specifically use this word, I use non-English words. And I think for most people, they can sort of understand in context, like, oh, this is a type of food. Like, oh, this means mom or, you know, like they could they can understand it. And um, and yet, I still have some readers on like Goodreads or what some reviews that will say like, "I wish there was a translation." I'm like, that's not really the point, though. Like, if it's an important word, it will you, you I will tell you. I will find a way to tell you what it means. But if I'm just talking about a color or a piece of clothing, like you know, it, it's not important. It's it's just it's there for uh, the readers who will understand. Yeah, I grew up having to Google a lot of stuff about America, so other people can do it too. Um, I actually was particularly concerned about other South Asian readers as well. Um, I did not grow up speaking an Indian language in my house, but there were multiple languages floating around in the ether. My parents are not from the same uh, caste community religious background, and so sometimes a word would be said and I literally wouldn't know if it was Tamil, Kannada, Telugu, or Hindi. Um, and so there are, there are, or, or Malayalam, there's Malayalam in there too. So there are words that were like in my sort of vocabulary that I have like said to other South Asians in adulthood. And they have told me that I'm saying it wrong or that it's, that's not really a word. Um, and so I, but I think like, that's how I experience them. And so like, it's my reality, you're in it. Um, and Viet Thanh Nguyen always says like, 
he tells minority writers to write as though you are the majority and take all the privileges that come with it. Like this is one of the only places you can do that. So um, yeah, I think it's really valuable to not explain um, and let people figure it out. Yeah, I'll, uh, I am, my experience is totally the same as Sanjana's experience. I did not grow up, regrettably, I did not grow up speaking any other language than English, but uh, Telugu, Hindi, these were, these were languages that I heard regularly. Um, and when I heard conversations, not in English, I could figure out kind of what people were saying, right? You can understand a lot through context. So, you know, if my father or one of my relatives slipped in to Telugu and, you know, had some Telugu words mixed in with the English, I could, I knew what they were talking about. So I don't think that's any different, right, than, than, than writing. I mean, you, you, the context is everything. And so um, I just use the words as I, as, I, as I imagined hearing them in a conversation from somebody. Um, I have many friends who speak multiple languages and they share some of the languages and they slip in and out. And I can, I can figure it out because of the context uh, a lot of times. So, um, so yes, I, I don't explain either. Thank you all so much for spending this hour answering all these questions. Um, it's been such a pleasure. I think we're about a couple minutes over. Um, so we'll go ahead and wrap. And thank you everyone for tuning in and listening to our conversation. Um, again, so much gratitude to be in conversation with all of you and, and for our audience. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Magna, for moderating. Thank you, Magna. Thank you. This was so great.